Natalie, I'm going to hand over to you as chair of our next session, uh, the first of our two sessions on governance. Yes, governance one. Welcome to governance one. And we have three wonderful speakers for governance one. Uh, we have online uh, Professor Rosemary Langford from Melbourne Law School. We have Bavesh Nasi, who's a partner at Grant Thornton, and Harriet Wallow Shill, who is founder and principal of Wallow's Legal. Um, so each of the presenters are going to speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll open it up as we have in previous panels for Q&A at the end. So maybe I'll start by introducing uh, Rosemary in a bit more detail. Uh, she is our first speaker and as I said, she is a professor at Melbourne Law School where she's also the acting director of the Centre for Corporate Law. Um, for the last three years, uh, Rosemary received an ARC, an Australian Research Council grant, uh, to undertake a project on the governance and regulation of charities. Uh, so today I believe she is presenting some of that research, some empirical research uh, that she has undertaken on charity trustees, governance duties and conflicts of interest. So I will hand it over. Rosemary, I think you can see me from that camera over here. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to try to share my screen. Uh, is that working? No. Is that working now? No. <laughs> yes. But only half of it. Sorry. All right. Let's see if I can get it to work. So good. Is that better? Sorry, it's very hard for me to see you and see this. Um, okay, perhaps I'll, oh, it's not on slideshow. Yeah, I think you just need to put on slideshow. Yeah, sorry, something's just happened with the, sorry about this, everyone. Usually it's much easier. Um, perhaps I won't worry, oh, I'll try. It's just the Zoom panels have gone over my other panels, which doesn't usually, oh, here we go. Oh, sorry, <laughs> this slideshow thing is actually gone now. Oh. Um, perhaps I won't worry about slides, sorry. Um, they don't seem to be loading properly. I think my Zoom just upgraded and... Um, um, we can see your slides, it's just not on slideshow, not slideshow, so you can just go through them anyway. I'll just go through them anyway. I'm sorry, I was, hoping, yeah, yeah. I was hoping to test it during the break, but no one was there. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, well, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Sorry I can't be there in person, and thanks for facilitating my presentation online. So um, today I'm going to outline some empirical research I've done in the form of an extensive survey of responsible persons of charities in Australia in relation to governance duties and conflicts of interest. I'm going to start by giving brief background to this research, then outline the survey and the main findings. I'm keen to get your feedback, particularly on the recommendations. So if anyone's got time for a quick chat afterwards or to send me some email points, I'd be um, really grateful. Um, so just in terms of um, background, oh, it's not, you're not seeing the, can you see that? We can see it. We Sorry. can see the background. There's actually a delay between me and what I, what I hear. Okay. Um, so just in terms of background um, with this survey, I undertook a similar survey in England and Wales, and I've done a comparison of both jurisdictions. So um, the survey in relation to England and Wales has already been published. I've got one coming out on the Australian survey that I'll talk about today and a comparison between the two. I'll also be bringing out some um, analysis of some of the interesting issues, um, such as contrast between older and younger respondents, small and large um, 
uh, organisations. Um, further background is that this is all part of the three-year project that Natalie mentioned, funded by the Australian government through the Australian Research Council on Governance and Regulation of Charities. And a particular aspect of the project has been assessing complexities associated with regulatory and governance frameworks applicable to charities in Australia with a view to making suggestions for reform. Um, so the aim of um, this research was to gain insight into governance and enforcement frameworks in the charitable sphere in Australia and in England and Wales, and I'll talk about why England and Wales later. I recruited participants by having peak bodies and other people distribute links to the survey. Thank you very much to those of you who helped me with this. It was a big job. And also by sending emails directly to charities. The total number of usable responses I got was 419. So emphasis was placed on two things. Um, that was how those who govern charities understand their obligations and how charitable entities um, deal with conflicts of interest in a practical sense in terms of what protocols are in place, how often the issue of conflicts arises, and when conflicts do arise, how they're dealt with. It's useful to look at conflicts, I think, because of their importance in governance and also their presence in general law, statutory and soft law requirements. In addition, I think identification and appropriate management of conflicts is indicative of broader compliance with governance requirements. Conflicts also pose a real problem in practice, um, if you look at the ACNC compliance results at least. A further reason is that uh, the extent to which non-pecuniary and third-party conflicts are en encompassed in the legal rules relating to conflicts of interest is unclear, um, so it was useful to see what responsible persons of charities thought about that. They're clearly included with AC within ACNC guidance on conflicts. The existence of a conflict of interest isn't bad, of course. Um, it's the disclosure and management that are important, um, and these are um, situational, of course. So the survey also tested other things, such as financial uh, management. So I tested respondents' understanding of the charity's financial position, whether they rely on someone else in this respect. I looked at the centrality of purpose in decision-making. I looked at motivations, um, given that motives play a fundamental role in explaining and encouraging compliance. I also asked respondents what might help them in practical terms to comply with their duties and the, some of the options included training, a detailed online guide that sets out all governance duties, a charity governance code, practical examples and scenarios, access to professional advice, more guidance from the ACNC and mentoring. Um, so why did I choose surveys? Uh, that was to maximise the number of persons participating I kept the um, estimated completion time short to encourage a maximum number of responses, but that did mean that at times there could have been a bit more nuance um, in the questions. Um, the results were analysed um, using a number of statistical techniques. I hope to follow these results with um, some more com consultation. So I said, as I said, if any of you had have time for a chat um, or um, a formal interview, I'd really appreciate you getting in contact. Um, Okay, so what were the main findings of the surveys? So firstly, um, despite, despite the complexity that we see in the regulatory framework applicable to charities, respondents seem to have a good grasp of conflicts of interest, although there's a question as to how diligently they're being managed in practical terms. Respondents thought they had a good understanding of their governance duties in the financial accounts, although around a quarter said they relied on someone else to take responsibility for the entity's financial position. Um, it is notable that a number of respondents in the comments commented on complexity and duplication of duties and on the fact that other persons don't, other responsible persons don't understand their duties. There appears to be a disconnect, though, between respondents' perception of their understanding of their governance duties and the actual observance of governance duties. Um, in practice, given that conflicts of interest aren't um, declared as often as you would expect, given the number of responsible persons on boards, this suggests a potential need for tighter formal processes and encouragement, perhaps of abstention where there's a conflict. Um, in terms of purpose, there was little doubt that respondents closely connected decision making um, with the entity's purpose. The concept of um, potential perceived conflict, which we know plays a core role in the ACNC regime, is complex. So some respondents emphasised the importance of including perceived conflicts and others pushed back 
uh, emphasising the need for a realistic approach to conflicts. Uh, so respondents would welcome assistance with understanding and complying with their governance duties. So the top three most popular options were firstly a detailed online guide setting out all the governance duties of board members, secondly a charity governance code, and thirdly practical examples and scenarios um, showing how the duties are applied. In direct questioning, um, respondent, uh, responsible persons gave the um, conflicts rule a wide ambit in terms of non-pecuniary and third-party interests, and that, of course, accords with the um, ACNC conflicts guide. However, when, um, so the final three questions in the survey were hypothetical scenarios, and when answering those hypothetical scenarios in relation to conflicts of interest, respondents' opinions didn't always accord with their more theoretical ideals. So a constant theme in the comments, so at various points, um, respondents could comment, a constant theme um, were the problems caused by complexity, inconsistency and change. So respondents commented on pro proliferation of standards within and across governments, multiple reporting requirements and problems caused by the turning off of the duties in the Corporations Act. And that wasn't a direct question that I asked that was raised by respondents in questions. The burden of red tape was also a noteworthy theme in the comments. A number of respondents, as I said, um, said that although they understood their duties, other people didn't. Um, people also raised the problem of time constraints, but there were also a number of positive comments about governance training and guidance within organisations. There are lots of interesting um, nuances and other findings. I've only got 10 minutes, uh, probably used five of that trying to slide uh, screen share, um, but the main predictors are the age of the respondent and the size of the entity. And I'll be bringing out some more nuances in terms of the differences between respondents of smaller and larger obligations, younger and older respondents, um, respondents from religious entities as opposed to other entities. And there are also some differences between companies um, as opposed to other entities. Um, so just in terms of re um, recommendations, and these are preliminary, um, and I'm very keen to consult more on these. In legal and academic terms, and I recognise that this is just a small drop in the ocean of questions we have about the charity sphere, um, the core need seems to be to reconcile all these multiple governance duties under four or five key duties or standards and referred to standards before, and I think that's a good word. Um, so I think that we can see or show that all, all of the myriad governance duties really can be reconciled under five core duties. And in my view, they correspond to the duties that apply um, to fiduciaries centred in a purpose-based model. Um, so I'll be undertaking um, that sort of reconciliation. And from that, I think a workbook could be developed linking responsible persons, statutory and soft law obligations to the central duty. So I'm not talking about extra regulation. I'm really talking about mapping it out. Um, so that could incorporate tables that reconcile all the statutory duties, general law duties, ACNC governance standards, and then people could add other things like requirements of the ACFID code or funding um, grants. I'm going to undertake this task. Um, so I would note that that was the most practical tool nominated by respondents in the survey. So a number of other practical measures could be considered. So firstly, the provision of low and accessible training. And I think the ACNC will like to hear that given the launch of the e-learning um, program yesterday, um, but also Justice Connect has some excellent guides as well. Secondly, perhaps educating um, the uh, charity sector about conflicts management techniques and potentially amending the ACNC conflicts guide to give um, more guidance in terms of um, conflicts management techniques. Further guidance could be given on related party transactions. Um, now, since I sort of made that recommendation after the surveys, the ACNC has brought out some really helpful um, guidance on related party transactions. I think just needs to be a little bit clearer in the spot where it refers to AASB 124 um, because it's that standard is really hard to understand. Um, so I think there's a particular need to support and empower younger responsible persons and those from smaller charities. And I'll 
I'll be looking into that and making recommendations. So although a charity governance code was one of the popular options, I am not proposing to recommend that. We also already have the ACFID code, the AICD not-for-profit governance principles. The feedback from the people I've consulted so far says that we just they say we don't need another layer of governance. Um, there appears to be a need for further work in reducing red tape and regulatory burden overlap, particularly because of the comments. So just quickly, and I know I'm running out of time, just a comparison with England and Wales. Why did I um, compare with England and Wales? Um, apart from the fact that I really want to go there. Um, it appears on paper to have a more coherent and less complex framework, um, more detailed and prescriptive guidance on conflicts of interest from the Charity Commission, a Charity Governance Code, and also a bespoke charitable legal structure, the CIO. Surprisingly, it didn't appear to be significant in respondents' perception of their understanding of their duties. In both jurisdictions, there appears to be a disconnect between the, the perception and the reality. Um, it was interesting that despite the Charity Commission guidance being much more specific about conflict management techniques, the factors that influence how you manage a conflict, and there wasn't actually a great deal of difference between the answers from respondents from each jurisdiction. In both jurisdictions, the most popular practical option was that guide setting out all the relevant governance duties. However, I would note that Australian respondents were more interested in practical help and commented much more on complexity, inconsistency, change and the burden of red tape. And those weren't things that I specifically asked about. So I'll finish there. Um, I am finalising my recommendations soon, so I'd love to hear from any of you. Um, if you've got any comments or have time for a chat. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. I don't know if anybody else has spent three years undertaking empirical research, but it's an enormous amount of work. It sounds like an enormous amount of work went into this project. And you said you got 419 responses. Is that right? That sounds like a very high, uh, high response rate that you got from your surveys. Um, yeah, 419 in Australia and 300 and, I don't know, 380 in um, England and Wales. But I had to send yeah. out so many. I spent my summer holidays <laughs> emailing yeah. so many charities. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, no, it sounds like there's, and also we've got, you've got some very good oh. concrete recommendations, uh, I think. And, in fact, uh, that leads me to our next <laughs> speaker who maybe can start implementing, Rosemary, one of your recommendations, which is education on related party transactions, because that is the topic of the next talk. Uh, and that is from Bavesh Nasi, who is the head of the not-for-profit group at Grant Thornton. He's also a partner in their audit group. Um, and he's a social impact and not-for-profit sector specialist. So he focuses on educational institutions aged care providers, disability uh, and community housing uh, uh, providers and the broader charitable sector. And I'd also just like to personally take, take the opportunity, Vivesh, to thank you for providing your offices, Grant Thornton's offices for our AGM, Clancy's AGM yesterday. So thanks for doing You're that welcome. for us. All right, I'll have to thank um, Rosemary for the wonderful segue. Um, and Ian, to your point, I also hope there was something magical in that tea because now we're shifting the dial to accounting standards <laughs> on a Friday afternoon, which is always interesting. I'd also like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional on which we meet today and would like to also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, one of my fondest memories of my childhood actually is my first day in year one. I remember just walking into the room and I started talking to this other kid and everything was fairly normal. And then within 10 minutes or so, the teacher walks in and I realized that the kid that I was talking to was the teacher's son. And I think that was my very first exposure to what a related party <laughs> could be. <laughs> And I decided then that I would come to Clans <laughs> and talk about it only a few years later. Now, I'll hold this bit 
topics. All right. So firstly, it is important to understand the financial reporting landscape before we start going into the accounting standards. And so I thought I'd provide a quick overview of what that looks like. We've got three tiers effectively of financial reporting. Tier one is what we call general purpose financial report. And that's applicable mandatorily to companies like listed entities. So ASX listed entities have no choice but to comply with tier one reporting. And as you can tell, they're obliged to comply with the full related party disclosures under WSB 124. Next up, we've got what we call general purpose simplified disclosure. And so effectively what we call in the accounting world, the recognition and measurement principles between the first tier and the second, second tier are the same, but the second tier allows for some provisions to reduce your disclosures. And that apply, applies to related party disclosures as well. That I would say is probably the best practice for large not-for-profits and something that we are quite um, strong on in terms of our view in the sector and transparency in the sector. But then we also have tier three, which is basically anything that is not the first two tiers. So they can effectively do whatever they want as long as they state what they've done in their accounting policies, the numbers are as they present themselves. And there is no obligation under that framework to disclose related party transactions. The caveat I would make to that is that regulators can have their own requirements under that framework. And the classic example is where the ACNC has prescribed certain related party disclosures for even smaller, medium and large entities based on their size. And you may have covered this um, either yesterday or there's more information on the ACNC website. So, I don't purport to go through that, but the main point is that the regulators can span across all three frameworks. And so predominantly it's important to understand what financial reporting framework an organization is applying and then up and see whether there are specific requirements of that regulator as part of that reporting requirement. So what I'd like to do is actually focus on that first top right-hand corner, WSB 124, so that we actually get an understanding of what the full disclosure regime looks like. Let's start with the why. So this is straight out of the standard. As you can see, it's entirely focused on the user. So you wanna focus on what the users are gonna get out of it. It is there as a disclosure necessary to draw the attention that the financial position performance of the organization has been impacted by the existence of related parties. And if you put that into the context of a not-for-profit organization, that information is also useful to understand whether the financial resources of the organization are being used in, in accordance with the objects of the organization and whether they are contributing to the social impact that, it, that they purport to state. The, for example, the other example is where an organization may be receiving a pro bono rent from an entity that's controlled by the director. And so that information is useful for the users to understand that if it were not for that transaction, the organization's finances may be in a different state. And hence that point's made relevant. So moving on to, down to the who of WSB 124. Now, arguably, this is the toughest, um, I guess, criteria because if we don't get the who right, then obviously we won't be able to disclose the relevant parties. So let's look at who is a related party. The underlying points or underlying words in this in the slides are effectively definitions in the standards. So I'll walk through them as as required. A related party is a person or an entity that is related. Now, who is a person or a close member of that person's family? An octopus juggling cubes. Um, as you can tell, I'm trying to explain it in the easiest way possible, the accounting standards. So if you think about an octopus which has less than eight cubes, it clearly is in control. <laughs> 
And so an individual that has control or joint control of a reporting entity is a related party. In the most traditional of sense, we will see that an individual with an equity of 50% or more would have control over that entity. Now in the not-for-profit context, that's a little bit nuanced because we don't generally see individuals who control not-for-profits because of their legal structures. Next, it's someone who's got, who doesn't have control, but they have some level of reach or significant influence. And under the standards, that typically means they've got an equity of about 20% or more, but less than 50%. And under the, both of these considerations, the standards do talk about the concept of board, board membership, voting rights, rights to dividends, and the like. And as you can gauge, the con these concepts are less common in the not-for-profit space. File category is the most common in this space, and that relates to key management personnel. Now, key management personnel are not, is not prescribed in the standard by relation to their title. So it, the standard doesn't say the CEO or the CFO is, is key management personnel. What the standard actually says is it provides a definition around people who control and direct the entity, the activities of the entity. And so it's up to the organization to make a judgment about who the key management personnel are. Typically, it includes all board members, whether they're executive or otherwise, and, and a component of the management team. And so the organization has to draw a line as to where it stops within the management team to then determine who key management personnel are. Now, you'll note that the definition at the top includes a close family member of that person. So who are close family members under the definitions? Partners and spouses. So all partners and spouse, domestic partners and spouses are captured in the, within the definition of related parties. Who else is captured? Children? Dependents? And children? or dependence of the spouse or partner. So hopefully that provides a very quick overview of the individuals who are captured as related parties under the accounting standards. Now the definition at the top includes entities. So we'll walk through who the entities are next. Less graphic here. So we'll walk through the words. Um, who are the entities? So the first three are pretty self-explanatory. Members of the same group, so any subsidiaries within the group are captured. Associates and joint venture arrangements are captured as well. Post-employment benefits, so defined benefit plans are captured as related parties. The next three are a little less obvious and they are quite relevant to the not-for-profit sector. So we do see a lot of not-for-profits outsource their management services. So whether that be CFO services or even CEO services I've seen, which are effectively outsourced to a provider. And so those would be captured as related parties because they could, could be related to a director and the like. And so under the standards, they're meant to be captured as entities. Now, the next set of entities which are captured are entities which are controlled or jointly controlled by any of these individuals. And so typically the most common example we would see is someone's domestic partner, spouse, child, dependent, owns a company that then is contracted with the not-for-profit and somehow that, that may have been missed, but that's a related party. And that's probably the most common related party that we see coming through in the not-for-profit sector. And finally, it's anyone who's got control over the not-for-profit who then sits on a board or has significant influence over another entity that would be captured as well. So that provides a quick overview of the entities who are captured. So now that we've covered the who, we just focus on the what, and without going into details of the words, I effectively highlight that, you know, the standards are requesting that the nature and the amount around the, the related party and the transactions are disclosed in the financial report. And that disclosure is required 
irrespective of whether a price is charged or not. So in the early example, if there is rent provided or space provided to the not-for-profit on a pro bono basis, that needs to be captured as well. The other key point I would make on that slide is just in the last point around arm's length. Now, typically we see a lot of not-for-profits or even broad organizations blanketly uh, disclose that this is a related party transaction, but everything's on an arm's, arm's length basis. And not, now normally that actually is not the case because there's a lot of discounting, there's a lot of alternative arrangements that take place. So to put a blanket statement that something's on arm's length is actually incorrect. So the standards clearly um, state that that, can't, that statement cannot be made unless that can be substantiated. Following on, on the what is so group entities. So as I mentioned earlier, subsidiaries are captured and key management personnel, so the remuneration of key management personnel are captured as well. And if they're under 124, they need to be disclosed within those categories. One of the provisions within the tier two reporting is that that can be um, disclosed on a total basis. So how, how do we get there? Some key considerations to take away. So does the organization have a related party policy? Does this policy consider decision-making and approval processes? Have you made an assessment of arm's length? What are reporting processes and consequences for any breach of the policy? How does the organization identify related parties? So at what point would the organization know whether it has or hasn't entered into a related party transaction? And finally, what are the reporting ob obligations? So I think it's important to get the first two points right, irrespective of the size or the reporting obligations because ultimately it's a, it's a question of governance before reporting itself, if that makes sense. And so effectively I'd like to say that in the context of good governance, financial management and prudence and fit for purpose within the, within the sector, I believe the disclosure of related party transactions is fundamental to protecting the organization's most valuable asset, which is its reputation. Thank you. Thank you, Ravesh. That was uh, very, very comprehensive. And I saw a lot of people taking notes. So <laughs> that may lead to some questions afterwards. But uh, thanks for explaining uh, the related party transaction regime under the accounting standards come quite important, hasn't it? Uh, okay, so I'd now like to introduce our third speaker, uh, Harriet uh, Wallow shill And uh, Harriet is, as I said before, the founding partner and the principal of uh, Wallow's Legal, which is quite a new law firm, I understand, just uh, about a year old. Um, and it's located here in Melbourne. So Harriet's got a broad client base, but including a number of charity uh, work number of uh, charities and uh, so she does work on a wide range of charity law matters uh, and Harriet is going to be talking about uh, assisting charities with governance after registration so thank you thank you um, I'd like to begin by recognizing that we are on Wurundjeri land and also just to note that they are, to my knowledge, the only peoples that have ever had the opportunity in Australia to sign a treaty. So that is uh, slightly different. And they are one of five uh, tribes that make up the Kulin nat Nation, which is probably, if we think about it, metropolitan Melbourne. Um, I wish I could say elders past, present and emerging, but um, I feel like there's a lot of past, not that many present, and hopefully there will be more emerging. Um, now that we seem to have got our act together and learning how to respect our First Nations. Um, now, sorry, I just felt the need to say that. <laughs> um, I do a lot of, uh, I guess, being a small practitioner, I get the coal face of, uh, of clients coming in and wanting to set up charities. And they usually come to me saying they have a good idea, they've seen something in their community and they want to change it. So they're always wonderful people and it's a really, really lovely aspect of my practice. And so 
Uh, what started 20 years ago as an area of law that I was just doing on the side in between construction law has become an e a part of my, pra my general practice of equal importance every day. And it, it really does, in a, in a weird way, they balance each other out so nicely. Um, the thing that I have found is that I, I, and I guess what I wanted to share with you today was perhaps a little bit more of a practical think about how we prepare our charity uh, board members on the uh, notion of governance and how to demystify it and how to make it more practical for them so that, as Rosemary said, that we they all seem to understand what needs to be done but actually how to do it. Uh, so I used to uh, be a, a practitioner that viewed getting charity status or DGR status as the win, as, you know, oh, that's the great outcome. I'm glad I got it. And then I would, you know, thank the client very much um, and send them on their way. However, I've now completely in the last year or so changed the way I practice because it's become very obvious to me uh, well, maybe I just finally clued on to what Rosemary was talking about at the beginning, that um, people were just taking charity statuses and not really knowing what to do thereafter. So now when people come to me, they will come to me with a good idea and they come to me and they say, I want to change something. Uh, for example, I see a lot of members of the Indian community wanting to come and set up communal infrastructure effectively. So if you think about it, they're coming to Australia, there are churches here, there are synagogues here. 20 years ago, the Muslim community was doing the same. There were, were you know, but nowadays you can say there's a decent number of Muslim schools and, and mosques, et cetera. And so these days I tend to see a lot of um, Indian uh, clients of varying uh, religions coming to me and saying we we need a school or we need a, a community centre or we want to help um, new brides coming to Australia who have to adjust to the social norms, etc. So let's just take them as an example because they're fresh in my mind at the moment. And they'll come to me and they have no notion of related party transactions. They just want to do something good. And what um, I see my job now is to take these wonderful people who are change makers in our society and train them and guide them on how to establish a charity. Sure, get tax deductible status. It's, it's okay. You can usually, you know, if someone wants to help, say, new brides coming from India, that can be a PBI. That's okay. But also then once you've got that charity status, how to... Um, implement policies, how to, how to, what you need to pass um, at your first meeting of board directors, related party transactions, how to call an AGM, what you need to discuss at an AGM. So nowadays what I do is I'll, someone will come to me and I have prepared information packs for them that has, um, and I'm sure other practitioners have this too, by the way, I'm probably just come to the party late, but um, I have prepared information packs for them where they, they come and they'll, and I will take them through um, this, uh, the same points that we need to communicate, but I try and tailor it for each person and each particular cultural background. Um, so that they can understand and receive that information in a way that's relevant to them. And then once we've gone through the charity process, at the end I will spend time with them and take them through, uh, you know, basic governance, taking minutes, uh, how many times a year you should uh, meet, how who can be on a board, can you take mum's donation and give her a tax deduction or what do you have to tell people? Uh, so I find that this is, uh, I suppose, a different approach, but hopefully it's one that is um, helping, I guess, 
develop more resilient tra- uh, charities and ones that are effect- in the end going to be more effective because they understand what they need to do. And I think it also heads off a lot of conflict later on because ultimately what does good governance do? It, it helps people stay in their lane, so to speak, and it helps people manage complex relationships around family, charity, business, et cetera. So I guess that's just an overview of what I do. Um, I wanted to also just mention, I mean, there's a few, a few slides here. I've got the right thing here. I've got the right clicker here. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to skip through because I think we all know um, <clears throat> the, you know, director's duties, et cetera, and um, where what I'm going to, oh, I just wanted to have a little um, focus in on the this uh, decision uh, that came out from the UK and it's uh, concerning... Um, a company called the Keeping Kids Company. Now, the reason why I wanted to discuss this case is because it was an interesting example of um, people uh, being receivers coming and um, advancing a case against a board of charity directors on the with the presumption that effectively directors' duties should apply. But they're also in effect, talking about directors' duties that still apply to charities being, you know, trading whilst insolvent, et cetera. So I thought that it's an interesting case because it helps us think about where we should be trying to take our clients and to what level we should be trying to equip our clients to govern charities today and how to run them so that they have this sort of level of financial acumen on their board and this level of consciousness from a legal point of view. Um, So um, this involved a a company called Keeping Kids Company. It was a charity in England. Um, It seems that everything went very well until... um, Uh, you know, for at least almost 20 years of the charity. And by 2013, the charity had amassed a yearly turnover of £23 million. By 2015, it started to hit some uh, challenges. Uh, Sorry, 2013, it hit some challenges, experienced financial difficulties. This happens with charities. I think we saw this with White Ribbon Charity, for example, a couple of years ago. Um, In 2015, its board of directors applied for the company to be wound up and the receiver in the end made an application that the directors and the CEO, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to try and say that name, um, be banned from holding positions of directorship due to running an unsustainable business model. And um, the allegations was that the charity ran a business model that prioritised never turning a child in need away and disregarded the financial needs of the charity. Well, um, I don't know what to say about that, but I know a lot of charities that will prioritise his uh, helping people over checking their bank balance. And uh, so I think that this is incredibly relevant to all board members. Uh, The CEO, along with the directors, uh, alleged the receiver failed to ensure that their expenditure was less than their income and failed to implement the necessary risk measures. So they, uh, the CEO seems for various reasons to have failed to adhere to the written policies of the charity and the directors failed to build up the reserve funds necessary to prevent the company from becoming insolvent. Again, I don't know many charities that keep a reserve fund in case of emergency. I'm talking about the small, medium and smaller end of large charities. Um, I don't know many of them uh, that do. So, again, I I think that this would have caught the uh, directors by surprise to find themselves in court about this. So, um, oh, sorry, skipped one there, I think. Yeah. Anyway, the court rejected the receiver's application. Um, 
stating that the CEO and the director's behaviour was within the regular business dealings of the charity. Um, the court, they copped a lot of criticism uh, from the court in the manner in which they ran the charity. I think the bottom line for this is as practitioners advising clients, we need to be able to tell them that they have to juggle ultimately a yin and yang. They need to, although this in this case the uh, directors did uh, remain, um, I guess they exonerated themselves in to some degree, ultimately I think we should be paying attention to this decision because it we should be training our, our charities that in order to do good, you have to be sustainable. In order to be sustainable, you have to keep an eye on the finances. And if we're not training our board members as they come in, then we've got a very difficult job when things go to um, go through difficult uh, periods, such as perhaps a recession that's coming. Um, whoops. And then the final thing I wanted to say is... Um, I see a lot of charities, um, particularly in my particular community, where they run a lot of um, chari charity campaigns or GoFundMe, and they can raise an incredible amount of money. Or, you know, we could just see the bushfires as an example. They raise an incredible amount of money, and suddenly you are expecting volunteers who might have, you know, kids at home, a job, et cetera, to be running a substantial amount of money. So uh, I think that the, the as charities are becoming more sophisticated and there's more money at stake and there's more risk at stake, that we should be, as lawyers, really focusing not on just a tick box exercise of meeting uh, whatever form the ACNC is going to develop um, its, you know, processes and base its um, decision making on. We should be actually holistically educating our clients to become the board members that we want to see in our charities. So thank you. Oh. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your personal experiences as a, an advisor. So I think we're a bit out of time, Ian, aren't we? But maybe, maybe one. Oh, I see one in the back. Elizabeth. Thank you so much to all the panel. Um, Avesh, I'd like to thank you so much for that explanation of AASB124. I wish I had heard from you before I tried to read it myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, but if you could help me understand, because I was just popped up with the slide, but the terminology of associate, because when I first read that, I started thinking of the definition of associate as appears in the tax act, and that just, like, boofed in my mind. And I was like, well, what else does it mean? And I couldn't see a definition there. So what does associate mean in the context of AASB124? So an associate is, is yeah, an associate is a um, is someone who's got significant influence. And so when we said when I talked about control, that's a subsidiary of a, of an entity. And so in the similar manner, we've got an associate who's effectively under significant influence of the parent entity. So it's basically the equivalent of a subsidiary, but it doesn't have. It's basically that twenty percent that I talked about. Yeah. Should we leave it there? Could leave it there. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelly.